Thank you. Thanks, Jin Hao. Um, I'm so honored to be here and to be reading for, for all of you. I feel like it's a very intimate setting, uh, what we've got at the moment. So I'll be reading four poems from my book, which came out back in 2020, Antimedic for Homesickness. Um, the first poem that I'm going to read, I guess, I know that our theme tonight is about family and um, connection. And I guess when I think of family, I also think of language. As a poet, I write in English as a second language. And I feel like I wouldn't really be able to, to um, connect or reconnect with my family, whether they are in the Philippines or here in the UK, my new family in the UK, um, if not for, for English. So the first poem that I'm going to read is called Mastering English, and it's written in the form of a questioner. Mastering English. In the UK, when they say the sky is not working, they mean God is too high to hear your prayers or the television channel. The phrase a drop in the ocean indicates very little amount in comparison to what is expected or needed or all the migrants who mysteriously vanished at sea. An arm and a leg is the constellation Marara, deity of rain clouds, seen from the porch where your colleague housemate used to sit with her younger brother. Or what she says as she turns off her heater. What does I'm just popping out mean? A man rattling a bolted door, adamant to fetch his daughter from school, even if his daughter has already had daughters of her own. Or your lie when you left your child to work in another country. If the charge nurse declares it's neither here nor there, you must understand it as something unimportant or irrelevant, or an opportunity to ask, where is it then? So I grew up in the Philippines as a left behind child. It's a term um, that, that is used to describe children who are obviously left behind by their parents who work away. Either those parents work out of their uh, provinces into the city or out of their country to other places in the world. My mom left the Philippines when I was 12 um, to work as a nurse first in Oman and then in the United Kingdom. And eventually I became a nurse myself. Um, yeah, Filipinos, <laughs> nurses. <laughs> so I guess this next poem is my attempt to explore what it means to pass down something um, to us by our parents despite distance and time. The poem is called Notes Inside a Balikbayan Box. And Balikbayan Box is, Balikbayan can be translated as repatriate or to go back. And when I was growing up, these Balikbayan boxes were sent to our home in the Philippines by my, by my mother. What she does is um, she spent a fraction of her monthly wage to buy little gifts and put inside a Balikbayan box once for she sent it to the Philippines. And I remember my brother being so excited for what is inside the Balikbayan box. And this poem is my own attempt to, to explore that. Um, can materials replace um, our parents who are not with us? But also what is passed down through, not only through material things, but also through language. Notes inside a Balikbayan box. Dear son, in my place, here is a Balikbayan box. Here are the Lebron James rubber shoes size nine and the video game tapes to replace all the pancakes I owe you for every Simbanga B and PTA meeting I could not attend. I promise I'll be there for Christmas. I know I've been saying this for a decade now. Find the E45 cream for your grandma's tissue dry skin a stack of incontinence pads and tubes of barrier balm. Between you and me, 
Every time I roll old people onto their sides and lift their knees to their chest for suppositories, I ask myself, who does this for her? Tell Tita to leave her husband, her school sweetheart, whose mistresses are Madong and Sabong. Tell her not to bear the stink of his armpits. In the box, find the Gucci bloom, perfume, and scar creams. Tell her I haven't forgotten our vows when we were young, and her fingers smelled of licking me candies. Our walang iwanan oath to never leave each other. Dear son, in my place, here is a balikbayan box. Rip all the packaging tape. Every gift inside is yours. Work your hands hard until there's nothing left. Learn that to survive, we must have strong arms. To carry a tray full of medicine and not let one drop. To push a hyperventilating woman with speed and care to the maternity wing. To lift and sit a skin and bone man down on his chemo chair. To gauge the weight of a rose before you lay it onto a coffin. Take this box inside our house. That is all I ask you to carry for now, my son. And when I think of family, I'm always thinking of, um, I'm always thinking about distance and time and what other kinds of families exist out there. Um, Growing up away from my mom, it's not just like my mom just went out of town. We miss quite a lot. Um, I was 12 when she left. So I was in those like getting into and throughout my teenage years, she wasn't really there. So throughout those really important phases of my life, especially as a young woman, she wasn't there. So I was always thinking about the question of um, the narratives of transnational families but also what is lost um, and the space that we make between us. The next poem that I'm going to read is called Anagolai. And Anagolai is the Filipino goddess of lost things. Anagolai. I do not ask for divine reappearance. Let the misplaced objects recede in the heat of an isolated island where sunlight snakes across the underwater sand. Let the lost things grain the night sky against the blurred edges of Milky Way. I had traveled so far I could no longer hear the waves heaving onto a shore accessible only through below the towers of limestone rocks where a gap closes like a promise at high tide. Anagolai helped me find a torch pen in the peril of a drug trolley. Help me retrieve the will of my patient who pushes all pills aside with the back of a hand. Guide me for I have walked against the wind that is always homeward. For I return to find my own children tread past me as if I were a palm tree trashed by thunderstorms. Goddess of lost things, Today, a space council names an asteroid after you, and tonight, another world ebbs, a punctured lung. A torch ticks on. Its beam leads to my children's sand-speckled feet. Let me look up to remember the fifth vital sign has always been pain. Let me find a prick of light guiding, gliding like a plane, or if not, the rhythm of a shockable heart. So I I did mention a while ago that Filipinos nurses, when in fact we are not just nurses, there are quite a lot of migrant um, overseas Filipino workers around the world. I have an auntie and uncle in Italy and they work there as helpers and cleaners. And I also have a we also have quite a lot of Filipino seamen floating around the world. It's Filipino uh, wave, what you call this? Not seamen. What's the, what's the best thing to describe them? You know, um, marine people. <laughs> uh, so my, my brother is one, one, one of them, so he's a seaman. But at the moment, he's in the Philippines. He's waiting for another ship to come in so he could 
go on to it and do his work. So when I was growing up, I would always hear stories from my mother about these other Filipinos that she met along the way. Um, she would sometimes meet them at the airport and they have this like one more travel from that airport, normally Dubai airport to the Philippines. Um, they would share food from the country they've been to. And when I went back to the Philippines for a writing, um, for a writing visit back in 2017, I was at the Dubai airport and I witnessed how there were still quite a lot of Filipino overseas workers. And it gave me two feelings really. First is a sense of joy because after all these decades, I know that Filipinos, especially like any family really, I guess, um, they still have this um, they are so motivated to go away, to leave their family and to care for them from a distance, to really sacrifice for them. But the second feeling that I felt was sadness because after all these decades, I mean, the Philippine government still couldn't give a stable economy and stable job for Filipinos. So my last poem is called Group Portrait at the Stopover. And it's my attempt to paint a picture of the community that I love. Thank you for listening. And I can't wait to hear you read Laura Jane and Andre. Group portrait at a stopover. Take a walk over the sharp stones, then come back. Pablo Neruda. One, elbow to elbow on waiting chairs. We rummage through our luggage for treasures and out flitter sunbirds. I lift the 24 karat radiance of butter fudge. Take this, Sigina, and I will accept your focaccia and basbusa. Two, Manong, tell me your story until the whole terminal smells of petrol and rust. Salt soaked tanker, the skyscraper tide that almost sunk your ship is now the wind beating the viewing glass. Remember the afternoons that could burn a dragonfly, the oil stickiness of your wife's lips, and the baby you left one night who, by the morning of your return, had turned into a man with a beard. Three. Manang, you keep glancing at me. For a moment, I thought the burn mark on your cheek was a spotted moth wing. I am listening. Whisper of the days you must dab garlic on your wrists. I smear grease on your neck so sir won't grab. I speak of the years you spent sleeping on floors beside potatoes and pickle jars. And the day you learned how to arrange flowers for visitors, fill the vases with faithful water, admire the petals whose edges are like so teeth. Four. Manong, Manang, take this, and I will tell you how I pull out with five colleagues a bariatric man from the driver's seat and start chest compressions in the hospital car park. I will take you there, between rushing to a &E and the doctor yelling, jump on him, jump there with me. On top of the stretcher, the man between your legs, your hands pumping his heart. Do not fear the clatter of wheels, the bumps and slopes and corridors. It is only turbulence. Five, let these duty-free bags distract our loved ones from the scars on our feet. Tarana, let's not think for now of the next generation that will meet at this gate, the same old stories that will hum out of younger mouths. Let's go home to our elders' kitchens, where tapioca pearls soften in a choir of casseroles. Thank you. Ooh. Amazing. Thank you, Romaning, for your magical words. And it's always so lovely to hear out of your, like using your voice and bring them back to life again with all to our audiences. And uh, yeah, please, if you have not purchased Romani's collection, please do so because it will be a medicine to your heart. 
So next up, we have Laura Jing Li. Laura Jane Lee is a poet from Hong Kong, currently based in Singapore. Under her former name, she founded Kompo Rimo, Subtle Asian Poetry Collective, and is the winner of the Sir Roger Newdigate Prize. Her work has been awarded in various international competitions, such as the Oxford Brooks International Poetry Competition, Outspoken Poetry Prize, and the Poetry London Mentorship Scheme. She has been published in journals and newspapers Papers such as ORB, HKFP, Hong Kong 01, QLRS, and the Mekong Review. Her pamphlets include Chen Yu, Chin Ruan Ziri, Hedgehog Poetry Press 2020, published under her former name, and the Flint Chen Air, her latest collection outspoken by Outspoken Press 2021. So it's such an honor to introduce Laura Jean to our uh, Jean to our audience. Uh, welcome. Thank you so much, Sinhao. And thank you, Romalyn, for your wonderful reading. Um, yeah, Anti-Emetic for Homesickness is one of my favorite books. <laughs> so I was so um, blessed to actually hear it uh, from Romalyn herself. So today uh, I will be reading some uh, poems on the theme of family from uh, my book, Flinch and Air. Here, right here. Okay, so um, uh, I think I will read um, some um, about uh, my grandmother, just because um, there is a whole section actually in this book dedicated to the stories of um, different uh, women, whether they be uh, my ancestors or just uh, people that I happen to know. Uh, but today I'll be reading mostly um, poems to do with my family. Okay, so I will read her bio first. Tang uh, Ju Tang Pao Pao. Tang was born in 1936 in a small farming village in Doman District, Zhuhai, in Guangdong Province, China. Born to a family of farmers, Tang was the third child and only girl in a, in a family of four children. Tang had a relatively happy childhood, though poor, with a father who doted on her and was ahead of his time in recognizing daughters as equals to sons. They were largely unaffected by the Cultural Revolution as they were of the working class, but there were certain unfortunate events such as the accidental death of her sister at a very young age. At around 20, Tan left the village. She first faked illness and cited the pursuit of a cure in heading southwards, then under the guise of marriage to a stateside relative, known only by a smart passport photo, made her way to Hong Kong, where she courted many suitors but settled on a sailor. Why she did, I cannot guess. From her, I inherited mischief and vanity. These are some of her stories. The first one I will read is called My Lover is a Sailor Boy, because uh, my grandfather was a sailor. My lover was a sailor boy. Absence is the thing that catches in the netting. When he would come back to me smelling of brine and sea legs, the thing slippery and breathing, learning the sprawling vastness of the heart, the one that is live, undressed, waiting, punctuating our children, clings to pining skeletons, bathes the high days between rain, blooming giddy every season and again. Yes, bold for love's shivering, tossing dry of the ocean's light. I resolve to the daily wake, to high tide in empty bed, knowing my lover leans in for a bent kiss on the cusp of land and fluttering sea. So the second poem is We Darling, and it's uh, about um, the events that happened when my grandmother was young. Uh, her baby sister was left strapped on her back and um, unfortunately died of suffocation in the night. We Darling. We Darling. That strangled night when the moth black rained with hushed men shouts and high strung the lightning roughed our little mud hut. You, we thing, how you slept whilst creatures rang whinnying in the hollow weather. When mid harvest our little boat flipped like a fish wish in the storm wash eve. So Ma upped and went in the flurry of Chapa, leaving us the flurry bleed of slum thunder. It was just us, we one, you and me. You snug as a bug to the moon curve of my small girl's thigh. Ma left you strapped on white and tight. 
when all night round and round the wet cement, dark echoed like our upside down boat deep in the belly of the lake. Us bottomed in the twilight pour, diving for stretched hours until quietly your morning sleep seeped into mine sister body. My wee babe, your milk breath sift waning to my bone shoulders. Time yet tarried skittish as lung sacks in that crack of dawn. And when thunder panic laughs broke with soft sun, I swear your feathery child so too broke flying through the glassless window like a chick bird into the still dripping blue. As if strange, 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 the thunder shower milked you of all rousing. So when Ma came back, she sat howling and it rained some more. And another poem that I think I will read the last one of uh, my grandma is called Tears. So um, my grandfather actually had a, a pretty sad childhood um, during the war. And um, so when my grandma and my grandpa would go on dates uh, in the movie theater, uh, she would catch him crying. Tears. There are some times I remember to look at your face and I'm reminded of scissors. Your face in the dust dance film house, that ash shroud of sorrow, eyes sunken into wells, marred by feature length Cantonese tragedy. Hawlin, Tinha, Bumo, Sam. Over and over, the same preparation. Woeful are the hearts of all fathers and mothers beneath the heavens. And tears come as a flurry of knives. And tears come as a flurry of knives. So those are the poems about my grandmother. Uh, I will read one about um, a lady who uh, I have not met actually, but I was really inspired by um, the lyrics written by her grandson. Um, and um, the this Canto pop song is called See You and it's written by a songwriter named Lei Gunman. Um, and I wrote basically um, uh, a poem based on his his um, song, which is about um, his grandmother who left her village uh, to be married to a man in Hong Kong whom she had never met before. Fish wishes from a two-chambered heart. One, to make no choices. Two, to heed the matchmaker's order. Three, to be brokered something you can swallow. See, a coin or affection. Four, to be tender and fresh. Five, to carry my own flesh to the sea. Six, to swim these careless bones. Seven, to hold a mouthful of plastic questions. Eight, to consider cardiac anatomy foolish. Nine, to roam seven seas with five fins. Last scene, Pacific. Missing, dorsal fin. 10, to be unbound from the island. 11, to cut through the, this hill. See, Mount Davis. 12, to be coated with optimism. 13, to escape marination. Ceviche, bitter, sour, spice. 14, to roll up the gates every morning. 15, to not know that time is a thief. Stolen, light, shadow. 16, to have the long years throw themselves. 17, to finally allow myself to sleep. On his bed, see beside him. 18, to lose count of the days. 19, to be restless under my skin. 20, to keep me my scales. 21, to talk about the weather, that which I have weathered. 22, to sit by the window, 23, to let him hold me, under storm and sun, 24, to wish as a fish can see in a net. So that was Fish Wishers from, from a Two-Chambered Heart. And I'll perhaps read one about my mother, um, seeing that today is the day that I have reunited with her uh, for first time in a very long time. So, Ma, the heart of the matter. 
The heart of the matter is knowing perhaps, perhaps knowing that I must survive you. All these years existing again and again, your tongue a half step into the void, wanting for answers, knowing that I must hurt you. That shivering joy, that singing ache in the cavity you call a womb. Now where your heart sleeps every night, wringing itself out, every night when you ask a daughter, what's the matter? Knowing that I must write to you one of this many days. That was the heart of the matter. I'll be reading one actually for a friend. I don't really usually read this, but it is um, under the theme of family, um, just because I feel like um, this is as much her story as um, it is my poem. So um, she actually shared this story with me uh, for Hebe. Grieving in both directions. Often one goes hunting for grace, rifled as one doth when heavied. So to go stalking this kindness, thick with being irrevocable, pregnant with forgiveness, you realize that this is the wrong crib for a mother's translation of daughterhood, of grieving in both directions, heaving all bodies of grace and believing that solace what hurriedly passes and passes. Often, one goes killing for healing. And the last one I will read is uh, Michelle, for Michelle. Um, it, it's called A Ceramic Loss, and it's basically about um, my friend Michelle, when uh, her, her immigration story when she moved to the US. A ceramic loss. The country is always losing itself in my bed. I do not understand, but this is a museum denoting the coldness of silver in which drowns itself a people. How my kin found their toes in strange gravel to buy clock faces. And I, all lost with my sweated irons far up in the greens, those years there was no need at all for repatriation. In my bed now, that I've gotten around to reaching into the exhibit A. Bone, china, blue. Breath to my touch feeling so carelessly curated. A life this, no longer. Dreaming of losing the salvage, he walks out of my room and always from me, his face to the sky. Not lost, just away, just thinking what to do to the beginning of. So painting my face on, this loss, this woman is no, always losing no longer, nor sleeps itself in your head. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura, for your wonderful reading. And that was such a fierce collection of women's story that you bring forward. And uh, so, Last but definitely not the least, I am gonna introduce audience to Andre Nafis Sahili. Andre Nas Nafis Sahili's latest collection of poems, High Desert, will be published this June 2022. So it just came out, am I right, Andre? Yeah. He's also the author of A Promised Land Poems from Itinerant Life. Penguin, UK 2017, and the editor of The Heart of the Stranger, an anthology of exile literature by Pushkin Press 2020. He has translated over 20 titles of fiction, poetry, and nonfiction, including works by Honoré de Bazac, Emil Zala. I'm going to butcher all the names now. I'm just going to give. Uh, a bio in the chat so that I don't butcher the name. His writing appears reg regularly in the pages of the Times Literature Supplements and the Baffler and the Poetry Chicago and more. So welcome, Andre, for your wonderful poems and your wonderful poems. Thank you so much, Gino. And thank you, Jenny, um, for having us all on. Um, it's a real pleasure to read with um, both Romulin and Laura. Um, and I also really like the, the, the theme of tonight, family, you know, um, I enjoy both 
for sets of poems about that. And I think it's, it'll, it's nice because it'll give me the, the book's actually out this week and it'll, it'll give me a chance to read poems that I wouldn't, I guess, otherwise read from because um, I guess the, the book tries to talk about the American Southwest and the politics and history behind it. So a lot of the poems are fairly political, but um, there's one in particular that I think I wrote as a kind of coda to my first book, um, The Promised Land, and it's called Folie à Trois. Um, after the three of you disappeared, I slowly adapted to life without you. But before that came the final act of our family's international production of failure to integrate. Following your final bankruptcy, I met you in LA and ferried you south to San Antonio del Mar, your last known location. Years later, I still don't know where or whether to grieve. But in a way, I won't have to. You always did say the true migrants ought to be buried upright, like the Kurdish warriors of old, ever ready for battle. That was um, Falia Trois. Um, and then I want to read um, this other poem. It's called The Other Side of Nowhere. 30 feet above the ground, in a warehouse in the industrial outskirts of a city we never lived in, I knelt inside the near empty container to contemplate our nomadic misery. Mismatched chairs, kitchen appliances older than me, baby clothes, framed diplomas, books in a language my father never taught me, they would have stunted my assimilation. And in my head, an email from my mother that read, we're doomed, save what you can. So there I was on the other side of nowhere in sunny Italy. Despite the technological changes around us, disasters still travel in telegrams. Bankrupt, stop, sorry, stop, homeless, stop. Remember brother, when our parents calling us global citizens inspired great hope, but the world proved too tribal for us. And so your suitcase shall be your only friend while Shi Huang's fantasy of a godly wall proliferates across the planet. Weeks ago, two cops in Catania stung a 16-year-old boy from Darfur with cattle prods to impart the following lesson. Whatever the government says, you're not welcome here, as if one needed the reminder. All across the boot, green-shirted faithful lift their pitchforks to chase the monster of otherness. So don't ask me why I love to leave and hate returning. Is the answer somewhere inside this container? It isn't. But remember Cicero's saying, there's no cure for exile except to love every city as you would your own. But the past is always easier. When I was young, I fancied myself Indiana Jones and later with erudition came realer idols. Petrie, Schliemann, Carter, Kenyon, but you cannot rescue history from dust. All you save one, when, when they will crumble in your hand. Trash or burn the rest, I told a warehouse worker as we rode the forklift back to earth. Damn whoever said that hell was down below. They clearly never went there. Uh, This one falls a little outside the remit of families, but I think it's about perhaps seeking families and sometimes in the misguided ways that we try and find them. And it was inspired by um, um, a village I visited a couple of years ago. Um, it's, um, it's called Mont Richet, after the village. Not the smallest village you've ever seen, but close enough. A handful of white chalets at the foot of the Jura, wide fields of grain, the same six or seven surnames in the nearby cemetery and the municipal hall painted pink right across the street from its mortal enemy, the church. The castle that once lent the village its name, long since demolished, is now a thicket of firs. A fitting tribute perhaps to Pierre the Kind, an early Lord who gave his peasants free run of the forest and almost miraculously expected nothing in return. Centuries later, losing faith in the old continent, 
Monrichet's penultimate seigneur, the Baron de Polnitz, a Prussian, penned a letter to Benjamin Franklin, quote, I want to be numbered among the free men of America, end quote, and set sail, not long before Louis XVI met the blade, only to die bitter and penniless on his slave-run plantation somewhere in Ragtown, South Carolina. Um, I wanted to um, read uh, this. Uh, so far, I've only ever collaborated once on a poem, and it was with the um, uh, Yemeni artist Ali Ali, uh, who produced a fantastic um, series of responses to um, when the Trump administration 2018 started separating um, migrant families at the border and caging kids. Um, it was also at a time when uh, they, they, there was this politician that often said um, they're, they're not cages because they have Xboxes in them and you can't, you can't be caged if you have those kinds of luxuries in those cages. And um, she very kindly asked me to produce a poem in response to her artwork. And so um, what I ended up writing um, is called Ode to the Errant King. And this is for Ali Ali. Stop, my friends, and we shall weep over the memory of a loved one or thousands, or millions, who can keep track anymore. Remember this, that the only oath a promised land keeps is to make you suffer. And these days, every blanket bestowed, every morsel of food, every mouthful of water is another buck in the bank. Long gone is the lamp that lit the golden door. There are only walls and chain link fences and mylar why mylar? Envision its sheen, the deceptive strength of that metallized film. Imagine it used for warmth in the cold damp of prisons. What do you see in its mirror-like surface, if not the face of a monster? What is a human observed through the slits of a cage? Can you still call them human? What is a great global city, a great country, whatever that is, without an island of tears? a terminal of surrender. What is life if not Imru al Qais's poison cloak? Beautiful to behold, deadly to wear. Enduring wrongs endure, nothing changes. And so tell me why I still believe in the journey. Moving is hope and it shushes the mind and fills the heart with something other than fear. Mylar, Melanex, Hostafan, names that provide the illusion of comfort and safety, of guiltlessness. Is a prison still a prison if the inmates have Xboxes? What sadder use could there be for that foil and its interstellar potential? Whatever became of solar sails, whatever happened to us? Consider the border, any border. If a border is a war zone, then what do the insides of our consciences look like? Therein lies a barrenness to rival any desert. And soon that desert will drink what is left of the sea. Consider also the sky. Bloodthirsty Mars beckons. How do you think, how far do you think we will travel before we rediscover our bond? How many rocks and stars shall we visit until we we'll remember that we're human? That was the Ode to the Errant King. Um, and I think I'll, I'll follow it up with, um, again, perhaps the a poem about the families that we create over the course of life and not necessarily the ones that we're given. Um, and um, uh, this is called The Bond and it's for um, Stacey Hardy, a uh, South African poet. Um, the dry August air reeks of wood and ash and the smoke plumes leaving the rocky bowl of the St. Gabriel's sink to kiss the lawn. The dogs bark themselves hoarse, their frightened black throats as charred as the wounded hillsides. No refuge for coyotes, raccoons, or the striped skunk as they scatter like sparks from a camper's hearth. What is power if not the ability to dislodge the living from their synchronous groove. After six months of death and disease, the rabbits stir from their nests in the crevices of rusty engines, 
and people finally begin to mourn. On Verdugo Boulevard, a cardboard placard stapled to a half-stripped tree reads, Goodbye, Emilio, or as the newspapers call him, John Doe, number 283. But nobody's heart's large enough to hold all the names of the fallen. On either side of the boulevard, a slew of recession-raptured businesses. To let, pray for us, and even the sign above the gun store, armed and dangerous, says, we're through. Today, my distant friend, I've only got room for questions. What does endurance mean if it appears to be endless? What is grass if not gunpowder? What is this chain of encampments and shanties hugging the freeway if not humanity's take on the Great Barrier Reef, each person a polyp on the coral of concrete? I think of you in Cairo and your imprisoned comrades, another tinderbox awaiting the flintstone of hurt. It is late at night, so let every word draw blood. Everything is not going to be all right. All my life, an unbroken string of departures, a litany of leaving. But here and there, faint glimmers of meaningful connections, including you, my sister from another mother, another father, another world. Perhaps we shall soon meet again, perhaps not. Perhaps the flowers stuffed into the beaked masks of plague doctors provided more comfort than safety, perhaps not. But what gives us solace between our first lungful of air and the last handful of lime? The bond, only the bond. So where to you now, wanderer of the wastelands? Um, Let me see. Um, I think I'll actually conclude with um, uh, the longer poem that I wrote uh, that's right at the back of the book, um, uh, which, which was really fueled by um, all the family issues that were going on at the time. Um, and uh, the, the only word I might want to introduce is, because uh, it's quite a, a strange phenomenon weather-wise, I, I had to learn it when I actually moved to the area. The poem is called Tule Fog, as in T-U-L-E. Um, you, you might pronounce it Tule when you read it, but apparently it's Tule. And what it is, is this gigantic cloud of fog that settles over the agricultural area of the Central Valley in California, a uh, breadbasket that feeds more than half the country. Um, and it's, it's quite a destructive force because it just makes life impossible in many different ways. Um, and so this is Tule Fog, and it's dedicated to Zenzi. After five years of life in the desert, you drive north as the fog floats over the fields like a ghost or a frozen prayer. And rolling past Delano and Merced, you wonder, what does home mean to you now? Then the answer rises out of the cottony gloom. Home is a sleeping bag in a parking lot, a bedroll in a barn, a blanket laid down in a ditch, but never a right, never a certainty. The sun is lost, and everywhere, the feeling that the party is over fills the air. The king tide of traffic recedes, and a voice on the radio is singing, I'm vaccinated and I'm ready for love. Care team members are busy assisting other callers. Your call is important to us and will be answered shortly. If happy countries exist, I've yet to see one, and 47 nations later, my idiot heart still races at the sweet sound of the wheels on the tracks. But for today and tomorrow and three years of yesterdays, I stay put, wrapped in a fog as dense as pea soup. Why fog? Fog is water when it dreams of granite, when it seeks the elusive safety of rock, a hologram projected by the Jew. Fog is a phantom bred by fire, it is the shape grief assumes. Fog is the reaper that sits on the freeway at night to harvest its victims. A veil the sky casts over the valley to hide the raw wound that we feed on. Fog is the state of the markets. It is the love that I feel for my mother and the hate that clouds the mind of our son. Fog is a tune that you hear on the boardwalk 
as you experience some maundering fancy of going out of the tide, as Jack London put it. There's no escaping it. Part two. We flee the city and lose ourselves in its open air graveyard. Call it the Zerbia, a chain of dry valleys, a maze of dirt roads, chicken wire, yucca trees, and piss yellow don't tread on me flags. It was the final act of the American homesteader, death plots for the legionnaires of empire, flatlining hamlets named after lunatic flyboys, cult leaders, pedophiles, prospectors, and other assorted seekers of extraterrestrials. At dawn, a lone bugle rips through the rare low desert mist. And like the old man said, blow, bugle, blow. And now, as the morning call of the covered wagons dies away, we bring you another story of loss and displacement. This is where I was orphaned, marooned, on Baja's foggy beaches, where my father washed up, broke and bereft, another mad captain spat out by the wrath of the sea. And no matter how many miles I devoured between Tecate and Taos, that fog never left me. I drove down country roads, exploring mining camps, chasing those embers of dead dreams all the way to the ocean. Nothing breaks your heart like a small Western town. A few scruffy buildings all clustered together, cowed by the might of the land, the devout, frightened believers of a vengeful God, space, the very space that one day will reclaim them. They sit here, patient, self-sufficient, irrelevant, waiting for that final exodus to put out the lights. At dusk, in a rented hovel a mile or two out of town, some relief from the heat as the sky turns cobalt, then black, then filthy blue. A thin curl of smoke climbs out of the pit. Critters crawl close to the fire. Snakes slither out of their lairs. And all night long, the bugle call plays on repeat. Perhaps one day I'll stop hearing it. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure to read with you. Thank you so much, Andre. Let me just bring you to the spotlight, I guess. Thank you so much for the wonderful readings you've done. And uh, it is my first time experiencing your poems. They are such a, a different compared to the other poets I've experienced. Like the, the words I've written down, it's like you always have, I don't know, is a intentional that you chose the wide lens kind of uh, perspective to write the poem even though you're talking about very personal stuff it's always a wide lens very sparse but filled with stuff so that was really wonderful and uh, now we are going to the last se section of our reading uh, so we would like you to, to raise any questions you may have to our poets um, so I'm just gonna see if you want to post any questions in the chat. If you not, you can raise your hand and maybe you can ask personally. Uh, in the meanwhile, I have one question for you all. Um, I think from all your poems have presented, um, I get a sense that the meaning of family beyond our flesh and our own flesh and blood. And how do you in your poetry reckon with this sense of connection with strangers and how do you seek that familiar tie with places or uh, people that you encountered? Maybe we can have uh, Andre first, maybe? Um, I'll, I'll let Roma and, um, and Laura go first, if you don't mind. Um... <laughs> I thought because you appear on my okay, never mind. <laughs> yeah, if you uh, maybe Romaling, would you like to answer the question? Yeah, definitely. Um, so a lot of narratives in anti-medic for homesickness is heavily influenced by my own experiences as a medical nurse a few years ago, and my narratives um, as a Filipino migrant woman, and. 
I guess in any migrant experience, just like Andre, there's always, just like in Andre's poetry, there's always that sort of um, being connected in other people, in other community, in in a place where you are at the moment. So the family in Antimetic is not just your actual blood family, but also your patients, your relationships with them, and also the relationships in the new country that that you that you have i guess for me it's just a matter of um exploration when i was writing it it's just a matter of exploration um what it means to be at home and being at home is always syn synonymous with being with your family with the people you love but also with the people you get to love and with the place that you get to love eventually And Laura, would you like to add something? Yeah, so um, I, because in, in my book, I have three sections. The first section is all about uh, the stories of different Asian women. And some of them are related to me by blood, but some of them are not. But all of them shared their stories with me. So I, uh, I remember this um, line um, in, I think it's in, in Faux, in the book Faux, um, which says, story is a, like telling a story. A story is a storing place for memories. So I felt very special that um, these people, even though they were not related to me by blood, um, and some of them I have, haven't even met before, um, they chose um, my poem as a storing place for their memories. And I felt in that in, in some way, um, their telling of the story and my telling of their story um, connected us um, in a way um, that um, is almost like family, yeah. Well, I, I really like what both of you said. And I think, um, you know, when it comes to, and, you know, this is one of those horrible labels that I think we wind up using anyway, but when we when you talk sometimes about the, the literature of migration and how that shapes families, I've always found it one of the great ironies of it is that we end up writing, uh, we end up being exposed to writing that somehow focuses on very limited parts of the experience. So usually the arrival and the so-called integration process once you get there. And for some reason, it seems to be a category of literature that also doesn't, it seems to get stuck at borders, right? So even to write about transnational families tends to be quite novel um, and difficult to do these days. Um, and it's not something that I think people also have much time for. I think, especially when it comes to the subject, we like our simplified narrative right because then they're easy to manipulate they're easy to use to justify various political agendas you know so i think something that i've always tried to do is show all sides of the process um you know something that really motivated me to write the, the, my first book which is about uh, largely about migrant experience and in the UAE um, was also sometimes to show the disastrous return after a life uh, away from home and what happens after that. Because um, that's something that I think also gets left out of the, the narrative quite often. Um, so yeah, I think I've, I, I think I've always been a, a relatively, I think, I suppose in some ways old fashioned poet where I've taken this confessional approach and used the lyric eye. But um, I think the aim there was always not just to chronicle the life, but to try and show the 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 similarities between us all because i think we seem to be living in a time when um there's always more excuses to draw up borders and walls and differences rather than see what makes us all um part of the same crazy species and so that's something that i've also tried to do and i think history helps with that i think um i've, I've always been quite obsessed with writing poems um with a historical perspective because I remember when I was 16, um, just before I dropped out of school, and it was the reason why I dropped out of school, we had this fantastic history teacher and only three students decided to take her class. And because there were only three students that decided to take her class, the principal came in and said, well, who needs history anymore? We're canceling the class. You should all take business studies. So I think that that was, <laughs> wow. that was something that really, you know, I think motivated me. And I thought, all right, well, you know, poetry about history. Sure. That sounds like something I want to do. Um, so, so yeah, I think, that yeah i hope that answers the question somewhat oh definitely i think um well all, all your poems like all, th all of the three of your poems kind of showed us like how violent a borders can be to just divide people but actually but then there's so much complexity and almost yearning for connection again when the border is presented to us 
and whether it's in the airport when you find a familiar places or somebody share a story with you, you just feel like you're carrying part of part of them with you, isn't it? Um, we have a lovely question from Jennifer Warren, who happened <laughs> finally made it here. Um, uh, I'm fascinated by all your family narratives, uh, said Jennifer, from new lenses. There's so much intimate knowledge, hope, disappointment, epiphany in these matrix of emotions and connections. So how do you use and balance between fictions or reimagining the reality and memory? Um, so we're going to go for our money first, and Lara and Andre. Thank you. Um, I think it's a really nice question. It's a really good question. I feel like if you're writing from a place that is heavily informed by your experiences, there's also that misconception that this is about you and that this is about uh, your work, about your mom. But what I really love about poetry and what I really love about working on this collection is that in poetry, we can be as imaginative as we can be and we could really we have to be um we have to use our imaginative energy i have quite a lot of um personal details about my own family about my own circumstances that i wouldn't want to share through poetry so i guess that's just a part of it is being self-aware for me um, and i think as a nurse i am adept at being self-aware um but also what do i want to to, to say to the readers, like ultimately, whether I'm saying something 100% true as in true real life story or 100% emotionally truthful and um, what it is that I'm saying to the readers. And I think it's really my go-to question for me when I'm imagining or um, trying to utilize the imaginative power of poetry. Yeah. Laura? And uh, for me, actually, um, because I am actually writing out of uh, family history. So these are real stories and uh, real things that happen to real people. And um, actually, because each of them have a bio. Yeah, can't really see, but each of them have a bio. And um, my editor actually asked me when I first wrote the bio, it was very, um, uh, was very straightforward so it was actually like there wasn't much um poetry in the bio and um the my editor uh joel taylor actually asked me to uh play with it a little bit take a little bit of poetic liberty in the bio because um after all if i were um to write it so straightforwardly it would be a biography it wouldn't be um, a book of poetry so um because um, in a way, these are their stories, and I am just telling their stories. Um, I these are these stories are colored by my perspectives, anyways. So um, I just ran with it, to be honest, and I just uh, ran with wherever my uh, poetic inspiration took me, and um, while also trying to uh, stay truthful to uh, the spirit of their story. Thank you. And Andrew? Yeah, I, I think I, I really um, I really like what Roman said earlier, you know, the difference between, you know, sort of factually truthful and emotionally truthful. Um, I think that's that's a very useful distinction to draw, you know. Um, I, I think there's 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 a quote that um, prefaced one of the sections in my first book, um, just by the French writer Aldrin Madro, where he wrote, um, it was neither true nor false, it was lived. You know, so I think um, because memory is famously unreliable, I think I've always tried to to write from a point of view of emotional truth and one that uh, in, in some shape or form, at least from my own point of view, whether it then it ends up being useful or not, that's another matter. But um, it, I've always tried to write about emotional truths that might be useful to someone else. Because um, I think when it comes to, it's a very underused term. It's it's a bit fond de siècle, a bit, you know, uh, belongs to the time of Flaubert, but I like the idea of a sentimental education. And I think that's what poetry does. You know, it's a sentimental education, I think mm. at its best. Um, and so that's that's something that I've that I've tried to do. So I think harnessing the the more connecting truths of experience, of lived experience is, is what's interested me. Um, and, and I think that that's, that's something I've tried to carry across in, in all my projects. Um, so it becomes less about the, the 
chronicling of things or about the act of confessing or catharsis than, than drawing you know, connections between various thoughts um, of our different experiences. Because um, again, I think that they're, they're far more connected than we tend to think they are. You know? um, yeah, definitely. And, and then this event's for three of you together, which is great. <laughs> um, we have a question from Zoe uh, to Romaling specifically. Uh, Romaling, I was talking about your work with the poet Hannah Hodgson the other day, and we were saying how tough it is to write ethically about medical encounters, but we flagged up your book as work that does manage it with integrity. Did you spend time thinking about this? And was that careful ethical approach something that happened spontaneously? Thank you. Thanks, Hannah. For, uh, sorry, thanks, Zoe, for um, speaking about my work with Hannah and also for uh, for your comment. Um, I guess initially it happens very spontaneously to me, um, and that's because I lived the experiences that I, I, I was trying to explore and I was trying to um, mold into poetry. However, um, throughout my journey working on on this collection i've also i've also th um realized that actually no matter what i did because obviously I, I wouldn't be writing the the real story of people patient etc um but i could only pinpoint the narrative and bend it and um perhaps add or edit a certain medical presentation or something but but ultimately, I guess for me, the most important thing is that this happens to so many people. So, for example, one of the poems in Anosmia, in which a nurse is uh, cleaning um, the the um, the patient after uh, she opened her bowels, that happens anyway. So it's a very human experience. Um, in my middle poem. It's a long poem that's um, the title is just like a bracket with with a space that happened. We have colleagues who died while we're working who just dropped suddenly out of either that's out of um, exhaustion or out of their own sickness that we have no um, idea of. I mean, just in the last two years in during COVID, we had a lot of colleagues who died. So ultimately these narratives exist and i think that's the most important gauge for me it, it it's not more about who it happened to but it happens and i'm always guided by uh, what lee young lee said which is poetry is like the score of the human voice so and with that voice for me um comes their narrative so when i'm exploring what kind of narrative and what kind of voice, what kind of story do I want to, to explore as much as possible. I'm trying to keep my, myself grounded and see, see it from that human experience, the general human experience, experience of pain, kindness, love, rather than a, a particular presentation of that specific person that could be, um, could, that, that we could kind of like see because um, that's I, I, hope, I hope that that makes sense. I feel like yeah. I'm not making sense. No, it is definitely. <laughs> I think it's the respect when you're writing a poem. And I think it's more of a, a personal uh, respect to them. And you that would definitely guide you to be more careful. And then you can never be careful, too careful, I think. Uh, but yeah. as long as you try, and that's what it matters. And I think yeah. the genuine feeling comes through to your poem, from your poem, definitely. Definitely, definitely. So acknowledging that respect, um, you mm -hmm. can ban medical presentations or experiences if you want. That's the good thing about poetry, but also acknowledging that this happens to everyone. Yeah. And at one point of our life, we would be that patient who would need some kind of assistance while we were having our bowel movements, or we would be that carer who's so tired of caring um, for others. Yeah. And I, I really like to, to uh, I like that, um, what you said about bring, bring the human experience from the other end. You know, we always talk about patients, the conditions, right? But actually the carrier is not invincible either. They will have sickness themselves and we didn't care about that either. I think that's what something brought to the life on the collection. I really love that. 
Uh, but by extension, I'm going to ask similar questions to Laura and Andrew, because Laura, you have uh, um, sort of stories from others. And how do you then recon reconcile with this idea, like borrowing other people's stories or honoring their voices in your collection? Yeah, so one of the things I really struggled with was uh, one of the poems was for uh, a girl named Gay. Uh, G E I G, and uh, sh uh, she is a Burmese migrant worker who went to work in Thailand. So how I came to know of her story was because she was working for um, the grandparents of uh, a friend, and um, I mentioned that friend in in the poem as well. Um, we talk about how we uh, we talked about how um, she uh, felt like she didn't need. Um, to go to Thai, uh, go to English classes, even though uh, the grandparents offered to pay for it, because she was very happy with what she had. She went from being working in a fishing industry to working in a factory to working as um, a domestic worker, and she felt very happy uh, with what she had. Uh, but the the grandparents felt that it would be great if she could take English classes so she could um, learn other skills as well, um, and uh, that she didn't need to be a domestic worker um, for for them for the rest of her life and um she she felt like that wasn't really needed and um my friend and I talked about um how um actually to to have the education that we had and had the motivation to actually get the education that we had really we came from a place of privilege and we were just recognizing mm -hmm. that privilege so when I was writing that poem um after I wrote it I felt very conflicted because she couldn't read it so I I got someone to translate it into Burmese and um she read it and um she she felt very happy that her story was being told but that was it and after that I felt extremely um after the book was published I felt very difficult I felt very conflicted because I was in some way profiting off her story. Mm -hmm. I, I'm getting paid royalties for the book, right? So I, I felt extremely um, conflicted about this. So I actually asked um, some uh, migrant organizations in in uh, Singapore if they could, uh, perhaps I could donate a portion of the royalties to a, a, a literary a literacy um, foundation um, to maybe help. Um, specifically Burmese migrants um, to learn to read because she yeah. she never learned to read. So um, that was something that uh, certainly I struggled with uh, in t telling other people's stories. Mm -hmm. And I still honestly haven't been able to reconcile it because the Literacy Foundation I wrote to didn't have specifically uh, Burmese migrants um, in, mm -hmm. in their network. So um, I'm still thinking about it and how I can perhaps in a way do right by her. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, it's very difficult when a certain underprivileged uh, group of people uh, or or people from different language, right? They may not have the access to English or to the audience that you have, but their story is still very important to be told. And I do feel this is the kind of things we, as creative or poets, we kind of struggle with like, are we telling other people's story? And I always being told like, we need to let people tell their own story, but sometimes they might not have the tool or language to tell it, um, then what, and we just let them slide because a lot of people might have speak a minority language, right? Not, not, not widely known like Vietnamese. Um, so I think it's important to bring the spotlight. I think what you did to donate to, donate to the, the cause, and for people to give that language to gain the language or gain a skill so they can tell their story i think that's very important and then lastly i'm gonna ask andre because you mentioned about a refugee relationship uh sorry experience which i have little experience about yourself but like uh, you did talk about other people as refugees uh, crossing borders and then how do you raise counsel that kind of ethic Christians when it comes to creative liberty? Well, you know, I, I think that when it comes to, to um, the work of a writer, you're always writing about someone else. You know, that's that's the real truth of it. I mean, even when you're talking about yourself, you write about a person that you no longer are. The, the mind kind of works in that way. You know, it's the whole eyes and other, you know, so I think that that's, that's always the case. Um, and I think that that's, that's something that's never really going to change also, because frankly, I think the, the way that the forces of history, to, not to sound too grandiose, but 
conspire to quash narratives. And so in a way, we always have to, in a sense, keep retelling the same stories um, because those stories get quashed and suppressed. Um, and I think how, how ethically we do so, how stylistically inventively we do so, then that's the real question for, for the writer. You know, um, and I think that that's something, you know, one of the debates that I've been interested to see is, you know, who um, should be, you know, saying certain stories, because so many people have been denied a voice, you know, and it's only right that they, they actually speak with their own voice. I'll give you an example recently that um, I, I'd never done before, and it, it certainly wasn't a part of my first book, but in, in the second book, In High Desert, um, what I was trying to do for a lot of the project was tell the hidden history of the Southwest, you know, which is seen as, you know, people think the Grand Canyon, Hollywood, the, the big uh, kind of redwood forests of Northern California, and that's it. They don't really think of the complexities behind it. It's still seen as this frontier territory. And what I wanted to do was really reclaim a lot of the histories, a lot of the narratives. And I realized that there was a limit to the extent in which I actually wanted to go out and write these lyric eye tourist poems where I mm. present my own vision of history and my own vision of what's going on. So for the first time ever, what I decided to do was write a sequence of found poems. And in these found poems, essentially what I did was, this is about three years of research, more or less on and off, was um, go through these fantastic archives that we have right now, the touch of the fingertips, at least a, a lot of us do, um, mm. and accessing these old stories and finding these manuscripts and letters and biographies that I would then source the poems from. So I would basically let, it's a sequence, it's, it's called the people's history, um of the west and basically you know um what it is is these series of found poems where i let the characters from history speak for themselves um in a way that frankly i couldn't and so that that was a way that i resolved that particular conundrum for me for for this particular project you know who knows what i might come up with for for another one but that's that's what i found for this one that worked for me um and, it, and it's the way i think that also to me, it was important to um, to point to the existence of these manuscripts, you know, because a, a lot yeah. of the text that I was using, I mean, for example, one of the poems is based on a horrific speech given by Richard Nixon in the 1950s, where he said, you have to shoot left-wingers like they were rats. Um, and so people will go, well, Richard Nixon, we all, we all know he's spiteful, but apart from that kind of famous exception, there, um, there are a lot of characters and, you know, historical figures where their works are available online. It's just that, that people may not know about their existence. Um, one of the, um, the texts that I really loved um, working with was um, the uh, words of Buck Colbert Franklin, who was this um, uh, attorney who essentially provided a firsthand account of the Tulsa Race Massacre in, in 1921. And mm -hmm. uh, it was a text that I actually hadn't come across, even though I'd read a lot of books about the subject. And so it was also my way of directing people to other sources. Um, but yeah, I think as a writer, you're always you're always writing about someone else, and I think I think you have to because then it, it if you're doing it right, it actually puts you in touch with people, and it may get you to change your mind. Remember that changing yeah. your mind doesn't happen that often these days, you know. <laughs> so and you know. from all of what you said, mm -hmm. um, I think what I get is like uh, you don't trying to claim the narrative, but actually showing showing people uh, there's another passage two different types of stories like you're only the little tiny connection to give people that key to the door ask to let them ask questions right maybe they they might not encounter in those stories but next time if somebody encounter someone with a refugee um, experience they would ask certain question they wouldn't see them as you know just oh trying to claim jobs or whatever you know <laughs> or spinning lands but actually they see what is what brought you here, right? What what kind of experience do you have that we had a chance to meet, right? What a fortunate thing to do. I don't in on top of the misfortune, I suppose. Also, like Romaline, what you did to bring those nurses from Filipino and like bringing them to life. I think that's just immense to like for all sorts of people because those people don't live beyond literary world. I think we're lucky to have those story presented on page, but they're actually like living people, right? Human experience. Same with Laura. Like it's really great to bring those people forward, and then we can then have that connection differently. And I think one last question, maybe very briefly, you guys can answer that. Like, I think in some ways you all tingle with some language. So Jenny has this uh, question saying, how does multilingualism change or deepens you as a writer? Does that help you to make it new? Like, how do you answer that? 
uh, Romali, would you like to do that? Uh, because you do incorporate uh, Philip uh, Tag Tagalog uh, into your poem, right? If I'm right, yeah. Yes, I think. Um... I think it's both, for me, honestly, it's both a curse and a gift, but more so a gift. Um, it's really hard to write in your second language. And sometimes I feel that there is certain ideas that I could only express in Tagalog and I can't express it in, in English and vice versa. Um, I say that it's also a gift because sometimes you will make, I would make a blunder and when I, try to craft my poem I'd realize actually it's it's much better to to, have to use this certain preposition or to say it this mm -hmm. way and I guess um, it's just acknowledging it as a gift more than more than a disadvantage for me there are a lot of ideas that are shared in literature and I feel that in order to be truthful to who we are as writers like i said poetry is like the voice of the human um um poetry is like the score of the human voice it wouldn't really be truthful for me to write anti-emetic for homesickness in a tone of for example an um an english speaking person so in anti for homesickness there's a lot of lines that are broken or a lot of syntaxes that are how I would say it generally as, as a Filipino. Mm -hmm. So again, it's going back to that question of, um, I did mention about asking yourself, who are you writing for? But also it's also important to ask yourself, who, where are you writing from? And I think keeping my fidelity to that. That's great. And Laura? I always think that there's a certain sense of you know, poetry, poeticness, and being caught between languages and uh, being kind of lost in translation. So in um, in The Fish Wishes for Two-Chambered Heart, um, I, I basically uh, take the, the lyrics that were written in Cantonese and sort of translate a lot of them actually quite directly. And it makes mm -hmm. for actually very poetic lines. And also, for example, in... Um, um, the one that I read about uh, my grandparents' uh, tears. So um, again, for example, Hauling Teen Hafu Mo Sam, it's actually just um, a, a name of a very old film. But when it's translated into English, again, it takes on that sense of poetry that um, I, I think it does not um, present itself in the original language. So actually it, it, it's very interesting because some things, you know, are untranslatable. And um, I, I don't think the, the translation that I did uh, actually ac accurately captured the original meaning, but it's that sense of being deviating from the original language, uh, the original meaning that gives it a sense of poetry. So that's how I think it sort of deepens my work in a bit, but also I'm obviously taking liberties with the translation. Yeah, thank you. And Andre? Yeah, I think um, I've um, I've experienced with, experimented more and more. I think with incorporating um, the the languages I speak into to my work. Um, and, and I feel like one day what I would actually like to do is is make a book that's entirely macaronic, right? Because that's that's the the term. It's a bit of a bizarre term for it, but that's what that's what it's called, right? Macaronic <laughs> literature, where you're just you incorporating all these different kind of languages um and uh and i think the possibilities that arise from that are quite endless you know um but i think it's always been interesting to me how even the most perfect translations don't carry that the true weight of a of, of the word you know like um and bread clubs is bread for in arabic are two completely different words really that carry completely mm. different meanings and connotations you know but um it's something that i'd like to do more of in the future yeah um just write write a whole book of uh there's actually a poet that i'm publishing i'll be publishing soon in poetry london where um he's from malta originally mm. and it's a language that strangely enough the few times that i've been able to hear it um spoken i've always been able to find it intelligible because there's a bit of arabic in there there's a bit of italian there's french there's english all blended up together and every line of his poems is written in a different language um, yeah. that cuts across, you know, these, these histories and identities. So 
yeah, I, I'd like to put out a macaronic book at some point. I think I'm kind of heading that sounds here, amazing. So. <laughs> okay, well, closing off, uh, we're gonna follow the tradition of this event. I'm gonna ask each every one of you if you were to recommend one book you're reading right now, what's the book on, in your head? What's the title and by whom? And uh, again, Romaline, <laughs> do you like to? Yeah, it's so, yeah, it's so difficult because I've been so busy nowadays. I don't have the time to read, but I read Andre Napis, <laughs> so here is um, High Desert, and it's so beautiful. It's full of narratives, different places, different people, and also Monisa Alves Faro's. Um, mm. so yeah, those two, perhaps. Okay, that's great. Hello. So I just started this this morning on the plane, but I'm reading uh, Rebecca Solnit's Wanderlust. It's about a history mm -hmm. of walking of bipedalism so um, and uh, exploring the philosophies of walking. Um, so I, I thought that was quite interesting. <laughs> very, very post-pandemic kind of <laughs> feeling. <laughs> My, we've been very familiar with the walking the nature <laughs> kind of feeling. And Andre, what will be the book that you would like to recommend? Well, Roma's very kind. Um, I, I, and I was actually going to mention your book as well, <laughs> because it's a book I, I go back to all the time. But um, the, honestly, the more recent one, it's, it's a book I, I reviewed not long ago. It's by a mm. boy who left us a few years ago, Les Murray. Uh, the great Australian poet, um, I think has always won me over for the fact that he, he writes about pigs in a way that makes you feel like you should write about pigs as well. And <laughs> I think that's, you know, it's not something that you expect, really, you know, just about farm life and provincial Australia in a way that, that actually makes you really want to kind of see it through your own eyes, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a book that was quite striking, um, also because it was this Kind of special book that no one thought he'd written and then they kind of found it as this hidden treasure among his papers so, wow um yeah so that kind of gives it an extra kind of special edge but um, yeah. yeah sounds wonderful okay so i'm just gonna do a little plug um please do purchase every poets that were presented today uh with the romani antes uh anti <laughs> sorry collection <laughs> sorry i'm just gonna <laughs> i'm really having a hard time with that uh, and then laura's collection as well and andre's high desert and our next event is on the 7th of july with penny broxall hosea kane joe dixon and julia webb so if you're interested as always you can 